Good morning and welcome to worship. We invite you to join in our opening gathering song called Easter Alleluia. Let's sing together. Day and welcome to worship. It's great to have all of you here today as we have a chance to join together to worship God. Uh, I am Pastor Tim and Pastor Katie is away on vacation today, but we're hoping that she's having a great time. Uh, welcome to those of you who are joining us online today as well. I know many folks are going to be still at home today, but we're, wherever you find yourself, thanks for being part of our worshiping community this morning. Uh, a couple things to note before we begin. Um, one of those is that um, as, as COVID numbers continue to change and such, our uh, policies around masking, those sort of things may still evolve, but know that if you feel the need to mask this morning, we absolutely want to respect that. Uh, and uh, so don't be uh, feeling like you have to resist that temptation just because the cultural forces might be moving in a different direction. But we invite, hope and pray that, uh, again, as, as all of us continue to wrestle with pandemic realities, we can make the best decisions we can. Many thanks to those of you who also may have participated in yesterday's uh, not community-wide NAMI walk. Again, going back a one more week prior, uh, we are celebrating the fact that our own walkers here, that were 34 in number, uh, raised uh, over $7,000 for NAMI, which is just an amazing, amazing figure. So thank you for you uh, who may have walked and for the four Poochus who joined us en route. They were also helping hands as well. The um, Iowa City School District Equities team is inviting uh, and approaching churches to be of some help for between now and the end of the school year, specifically volunteering at Northwest Junior High, where they've had some struggles between students. They're looking for folks to volunteer before, uh, after uh, school, and also during the lunch hour, for those of you who can, uh, just to be able to be a, a calming presence uh, for folks gathering in, in, those, in that context. They've got a training event happening this coming Friday from 10 a.m. to 3.30. So it's a pretty intensive training event for that event. But if you are able to uh, help out between now and the end of the school year, they'd love to have your help. Also, next weekend, the Catherine McCauley Center in Cedar Rapids is uh, resettling uh, some, still some, some additional families into hotels and homes. Uh, Lisa and I were up there yesterday helping out again, but this coming Saturday they want to get, if they can, one more uh, effort at helping to, to uh, get the last of that Afghan refugees coming to our community settled in. So if you have opportunity, go to their website and you'll note there uh, what they need in terms of volunteers and uh, you can gather at the center itself to help them out. We're still looking for some extra help around here too at Holy Trinity when it comes to worship volunteers. You may have noticed you may didn't have a greeter greeting you at the door this morning. Uh, some of those things, we have lots of roles that it takes to, to, put, to pull worship off weekly. And so if you're still trying to figure out a way of kind of wandering back into a post, um, uh, the heart of COVID world, as it were, 
and, and find a way of being able to help us do ministry, uh, please um, respond to those pleas when they come from the office or come from ministry teams. We'd love to have your help in all kinds of different uh, perspectives. This morning for worship, um, we're going to be uh, returning back to um, the Easter season and celebrating that. It also happens to be Good Shepherd Sunday, and so the music will reflect that a little bit today. We also want to say um, congratulations to uh, Paul Castellano, who's officially now our pianist for us for the long haul. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> we can announce that, and we're really grateful to have his presence to help us uh, in, our, in our music team. He's been a great energetic um, help to, for, to be part of our team this morning. So with that... Let's take a moment before singing our gathering song to stand together and just take a moment to introduce to yourself to somebody you haven't met yet, if you would. invite you to remain standing as we receive the greeting. May the grace of our risen Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let's sing because of your love. Because of your Because of your love, hearts are free. We lift you up, the songs of freedom. Forever will change because of your love. Because of your love, we're forgiven. Because of your love. So clean, we lift you up with songs of freedom forever. We're changed because of your Lord be with you. Also with you. Let us pray. God, we rejoice in this Easter season that you have shared your promise of life and life abundant. Beginning with Jesus' resurrection and evident even today amid the budding signs of hope and new life around us. We thank you for flowers, for gardens, for pollinators, and for the many images around us that point to what you have made possible. Welcome us as agents in the creation of those resurrections wherever we find them, that we might be emboldened by Jesus' example and willing to follow the Spirit's lead again this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
this time we invite you to be seated and for our young people who are with us this morning to be brave as you can and come on up and join me if you would for a, a conversation up here in the, at the front of the church. Come on, join me if you would. How are you this morning? Welcome, welcome. Help me with your name. What's your name? Eden. Eden, good to have you here, Eden. Is this like your brother Grayson? Yeah. Nice to meet you, Grayson. How are you doing, buddy? Good to have you here. How's it going, guys? Good to see you, Dylan and Elry. Anybody else feeling young this morning? Nobody else feeling young today, huh? Okay. All right. Well, maybe that'll change by the time we're all said and done, huh? Who knows? Sounds good. Well, I hope you're having a good week. Anybody get outside yesterday? Yeah. Get a chance to play out in the sun maybe a little bit? Was that fun? We watched the Iowa baseball game. You watched the baseball game. Well, that's cool. How was it? Did they win? No, they lost. Oh, shucks. Was it fun to, was it fun to watch anyway? Good. Glad you had a good time anyway, Dylan. That's great. Hey, you know what? I was thinking about a few years ago, almost 10 years ago now, um, my dad got sick. And while he was sick, um, he had a number of people who helped to take care of him uh, while he was in the hospital and while he came home. And um, before he, he died, he got to be pretty good friends with some of those folks who took good care of him. And after he died, uh, one of those, those caregivers, her name was Marguerite, uh, made us a gift. And that gift looks like this. It's a, it's a quilt. And we have lots of quilts that folks here have made, right? Too, we've been here before. We've blessed all the quilts, right? Remember that? You've got one. That's awesome. Very good, Dylan. Yeah, that's great. There's something special about this quilt. And that's because when Marguerite made it, she made it out of all of my dad's old flannel shirts that he loved to wear. So every single one of these squares represent a shirt that my dad used to love to wear. Isn't that a cool idea? Yeah. There you go. You like that pattern down there? No, but that one kind of looks like a C. That kind of looks like a C, doesn't it, with all the, with all the sewing marks? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Well, Why are there dots around it? Dots. Where are the dots? Where do you see the dots, Eden? You show me what dots you're thinking of. In here? Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, that's actually where somebody sewed like a leaf in there. Isn't that kind of cool? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a very special quilt. It was a very, very thoughtful gift that she gave to us. And you know what? Um, because of her example and her witness, uh, we just, we learned a lot about generosity and we learned a lot about what it means to care for somebody really personally and to make them feel special, you know? Well, to yeah, make them feel very right special. Here. That's called my microphone. Did you know that, Eden? That's why I'm so loud. You want one of those? No? <laughs> okay. Very good. Well, the reason I'm thinking of this is because we're going to hear a Bible story today of another person who was very thoughtful to people who also had lost loved ones, had lost people they loved. And she also made some art, fabric art like this, quilts, and shirts and tunics and things that she was really generous at sharing with them. Can you see a book about that? That's a good, good question. You know what? I'm going to show you a slide about that, better yet. How would that be, Grayson? Just a little bit, okay? One of our slides in our sermon. Anyway, um, she was a great and gifted woman and a good example of a person of faith who used her faith in Jesus and the gift that Jesus had given her, not just to kind of go off and live her own life, but to share that with other people in ways that are really powerful and really caring and really compassionate. And so one day when she died, they actually all the women and all the people who'd received the gifts that she had made actually formed kind of a parade. They almost had like a fashion show, <laughs> right? Of all the things that she had created and made because she had been that important to them and they had recognized her caring that much. How do you think you and I might be that caring? Do you think we could do that too? Yeah. I'll bet you we could. I'll bet you we could. We're probably capable of more than we can. We think we are, aren't we? I know I uh, should be capable of more than I think I sometimes am. So I'd like you to think about where it is today that you have a chance to care, not just for your moms or for the people who provide motherly love for you in your life, but for everyone, okay? Especially those who might not have anybody around, right, to celebrate the day to day. Watch for them, look for them, and if you get a chance, let's let them know they're special to you. Can we do that? Yeah. All right, sounds great. Hey, thanks for coming up today. We're going to continue. We're going to listen to that story that I was talking about just a moment ago, okay? The 
first reading for today is from Acts chapter 9. Now in Joppa, there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. At that time, she became ill and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in a room upstairs. Since Lida was near Joppa, the disciples, who heard that Peter was there, sent two men to him with the request, please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them, and when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter put all of them outside, and then he knelt down and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. Then she opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he showed her to be alive. This became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Meanwhile, he stayed in Joppa for some time with a certain Simon, a tanner. The second reading is from John chapter 10. At that time, the festival of the dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I have told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name testify to me, but you do not believe because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all else, and no one can snatch it out of my Father's hand. The Father and I are one. Word of God, word of life. Amen. Thanks be to God. Amen and amen. Thanks, April, for getting us rolling with that um, great example of what happens when the power of res resurrection uh, takes root, both within uh, Jesus himself and, for that matter, within uh, the early church, too. It is um, a day when we gather in the Easter season every year. On, on the fourth Sunday of Easter, we call it Good Shepherd Sunday. And it, it's called that because the lessons for, for all three years all of our, our worship reading rotation all come from John 10, where there's a lot of language around sheep and around shepherds. But because this particular gospel lesson is really only kind of tangentially connected to that theme today at the end of the chapter, and because Pastor Katie also did a great job of kind of covering the sheep angle last Sunday, we're, we're going to be leaning a little bit on focus today in a different direction. That is looking instead more specifically at that lesson from Acts, where the apostle Peter is said to raise a woman from the dead. The book of Acts, of course, is, a, is an amazing uh, uh, resource if you never have taken the time to kind of read through it. It's an it's amazing story of this brand new worshiping community, a brand new congregation of faith that becomes really bold in its witness when it's given the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because many come to know Jesus in the accounts that are recorded in these chapters. Matter of fact, the apostles themselves heal a host of other people, even though they do so at great cost and they are often persecuted in the process. Peter becomes known as a, a great preacher and healer, and Paul is converted from, from living in one extreme to, for that matter, another. And, and none of that, I suppose, should really have been of all that surprising had they been listening closely to Jesus, because he had told them, as a matter of fact, that they were going to be able to do even greater things, right, than he did. As a matter of fact, when it comes to uh, looking at the, the, the lifestyle of that early church, the, the lifestyle of the community itself was as much a healing experience as any of the, the particular miracles that they were able to perform. And the woman who, who had, had died and who was raised here was part of that community, part of that early movement of sharing and of healing. And her healing takes place within this kind of context, right? So their lifestyle was, was profound, was amazing. Acts 2 says, Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles, and all who believed were together. 
and they had all things in common. They'd sell their possessions, their goods. They'd distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. And then it says, day by day, the Lord, again, as they spent much time together in the temple, they, they broke bread at home. They, they ate their food with glad and generous hearts. They, they praised God and had the goodwill of all people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. According to the story before us, the woman who had died after a short illness, again, was indeed a beloved member. In fact, a widow of this community. And her name was, was Tabitha in Aramaic, or, or Dorcas in Greek. And both words translate into the, the word gazelle. Right? Not a great name. Any of you have daughters named Gazelle? Right? Apparently, it's a pretty common practice at that time to, to name uh, your female child after a particular animal you had great respect for. And in this case, they had great respect for Tabitha, for Dorcas. Her example was quite inspirational indeed, in that she apparently started and managed a social assistance program for the poor within her own community. The community of Joppa, where that same busy Mediterranean seaport where, where Jonah had once tried to run away from God's call. In this case, again, Tabitha embraced it eagerly. And it was in her day, the widows who found themselves kind of languishing at the very bottom rung of society's ladder. They had no one to, to either protect them in often cases or at least to represent them. But in Tabitha, they, they saw one of their own, and they found the hope they hadn't recognized elsewhere. Because for all appearances, Tabitha seems to be, have been pretty gazelle-like indeed. She seems to have, have been lightning fast at ministering to those widows and the most vulnerable members of her town. She seems to have been fleet-footed, just dashing perhaps from one place to the other with an enviability to be, to be, to be here, there, and, and everywhere when she needed to be, right? Wherever the need might have arisen. And when she wasn't bringing a hot meal to a homebound widow, she was so, at home sewing garments and robes and coats and maybe quilts to give away again, to those who had no one else to care for them the next day. But Tabitha's ministry didn't just, in fact, assist with, with basic needs. She didn't just uh, give folks uh, who, who were hungry, you know, a box of macaroni and cheese that might have been the easiest thing to do. In fact, she was an artist who used her talent to remind the recipients of her care that they weren't just a, 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 a kind of a painted as a all one, one class or one people. They were individuals worthy of receiving goodness and beauty in the world. So she did so right, through her own ability in the fabric arts. Even though they may have been people who were, who were oppressed or felt ignored by the culture of their day, they were not nameless or invisible to Tabitha or to the church of which she was a part. And so what did she do? She, she not only provided for them, she honored them through the art that she carefully and thoughtfully, lovingly created for them. Everyone, it seemed, had a, a story about how Tabitha had, had touched their lives. So much so that at the event and the news of her death, the widows of the community literally, again, paraded a veritable fashion show of what she had made for them. One after one, they came forward displaying the works of her hands while they told stories of her love and compassion and how it was that she had made them feel. Oh, so special. She first heard about Jesus, the one who led her particular congregation, from Philip as he came to teach about the gospel in her coastal city and this, this brand new community of believers was formed. And as time went on, it seems that Tabitha became one of the central figures, central leaders of that particular new congregation. In fact, in part due to her own witness then, Peter's subsequent raising her from the dead caused many more to choose to follow Jesus. Because Peter showed them not just the work of her hands, as did the widows, he showed them the works of God's hands, the work of the Spirit to be able to resurrect, to give life and hope and recreate and lift up, in other words, God's handiwork. 
when you think back about it, Tabitha got it, right? Because Jesus himself was pretty explicit in saying, you know, whatever you do this to the least of these, my children, you do it for me. Because God had given us the gift of Jesus, and Jesus had made himself vulnerable in becoming human, identifying with those least of these, to the point that that he told his disciples in, in Matthew 25 that, you know, a kind word to the lonely, or a visit to the prisoner, or a garment provided to the naked, a meal brought to the hungry, was in every instance a direct encounter with Christ himself. Whether the disciples doing such things recognized that or knew it or not. And again, no matter how you slice it, Tabitha seems to have picked up on that and somehow had become a a paragon of, of heartfelt compassion for the people of her own community, the people of her own congregation. So, curious about where it was perhaps that you might have experienced such compassion yourself. Or where have you, where have you witnessed it being offered? Right? After Kara Quinn became a, a Christian in her early 20s, she began wondering, in fact, where the women were. And what she meant by that wasn't that they weren't in the pews because she had plenty of of folks around here who gathered in her worshiping community, but in her tradition, they were never seen to be in the pulpit. And for that matter, she had a hard time figuring out where they were in the Bible. But she discovered them when she ultimately went to seminary. And after graduating, she started a, a blog and an app that she called Know Your Mothers. Great name, huh? Which she updated every day for the following six months, seeking to unearth the often buried stories of those who, again, well behind the scenes oftentimes, contributed a whole lot to make sure that 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 amazing community of faith we hear about in Acts was in fact able to function. She told and she gave a lot to to, to that biblical narrative, again, whether it was well documented or not, and it helped her see, in fact, that yes, there were women upon whom all of the disciples were, in fact, dependent. All the communities of which they are part were impacted. So where have you, again, experienced the kind of witness embodied by the Tabithas of our world or noticed the Karas, or noticed by the Karas in our midst? Where have you maybe received that kind of compassion yourself? Or better yet, where have you maybe shared it too? And who might have been impacted by your own witness in the process, whether you knew it or not. I was gathering last week with about a half dozen new pastors from around the Synod, and we were discussing kind of what compassion looks like today, especially in the face of of grief that seems to be so prominent and so ripe. And and our facilitator of that conversation suggested that while you know, walking in another's shoes is kind of the, the default standard that we think about when we think about compassion. She suggested that maybe looking over one's shoulder might be a better metaphor. In other words, taking the risk and taking the step to really try to see and experience life as another sees it. Doing so from their own unique vantage point. And feeling like that might have, in fact, a lot more to teach us in the long run than just walking in someone's shoes. It's an image worth pondering. Compassion. Looking over one's shoulder, experiencing life from their side. Having been a widow herself, the Lord knows that Tabitha had a connection that she was able to live out in that place. So well, in fact, that she was the first and only woman in the entire Bible to be formally identified by name as one of Jesus' disciples. The story forced me to kind of go back and and pause and recognize again some of the Tabithas within our own midst here at, at Holy Trinity, those whose, whose work and those whose commitment to discipleship, those whose continuing efforts at living out Jesus' values in their own life is wholly evident, is contagious in its spirit oftentimes, is, is dignifying of those who may encounter and may meet. And Lord knows it's certainly not limited to the women of our congregation, but it oftentimes starts there, does it not? I think of our quilters, right? 
those in our midst who lovingly create and donate their own works of art to those who they may never meet, but those where they know the need is great. I think of the small group facilitators who, who help ask us good questions of ourselves and, and Scripture and of the prayer warriors who are constantly advocating for others here. And I thought it's those who can really take the time to, to, to listen when they ask how you are. They don't just expect a, a quick response and nod their head and walk off, but they take the time to tune into what you say and allow you to risk telling the truth. It's those who like Tabitha herself, have lived out Jesus' message to love others, oftentimes valuing the needs of the other above their own, and able to see the divine there evident within the broken, the marginalized, and the forgotten being the presence of Christ himself, and realizing that the skills however unique they are, the resources that they have been given, were meant to be shared within the community, within the world instead of kept for themselves and their own good. Who are the Tabithas you've experienced here? I have a deep respect and regard for all of them when I think about them, giving thanks to them in the same way that, that again, a lot of times Paul was able to do over and over again in the communities he's founded. But there's one additional thing I have learned about such Tabithas, and that they aren't superhuman. Right? In the scriptures, Tabitha's own illness reminds us of that. That even the gazelles in our midst, those upon whom you and I so often rely and depend, need a break once in a while, right? And rightfully so. They may need a respite from, from serving for a time, not just to, to bow out, but so that they can be renewed and can risk the possibility of doing so again. I was thinking of that as I witnessed a couple weeks ago the ministry of our premise keepers on Monday mornings. Again, just to have to be due to a coincidence of vacations and appointments and commitments to assist some ailing friends outside of the community, that those who, who pitch in generously every Monday to clean and maintain our own facility were down to two people, right? down from a usual six or seven and down from one at one point had been 10. And I think, man, where, where is it that I'm taking them for granted? You know? Where is it that I'm not stopping to, to give thanks for their ministry, for their witness? Where have I assumed that they have more time for such things than I do? Or where have I relied upon them to the extent that, that they, they might need a week away and there's, there's nobody left to fill their shoes? Those pastors whom I gathered last week when asked and surveyed what was the most frequent obstacle to sustaining and furthering in ministry in their context, whether it was urban or suburban or anything in between, they answered overwhelmingly, finding people to serve. And the same was true at Catherine McCauley yesterday. So how is it and where is it that you and I can show them another side of church? How is it that we can show them a side represented by the Tabithas in our midst? And if such widespread compassion was what made the church of her day and the impact of her own witness so unique and so powerful, so inspirational, what might we point to today that makes us similar as well? I pray that, you know, as we identify that path and as we we ponder the possibilities and we don't oversimplify the, the needs or the demands, but we, we risk more than maybe we're comfortable with sometimes. That those who are longing for a reason to belong and to believe and to become find himself a disciple too with ample reason to be so. In Jesus' name, and in thanksgiving for Tabitha and all those who provide motherly love in our midst. Amen. Let's join in singing our hymn of the day, which is Savior Like a Shepherd Leads Us. Thank you. 
invite you now to stand together with the whole people of God across time and space to confess the faith that we share in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And as we celebrate the joy of resurrection today, we also want to pray for new life in the church, new hope for the world, and for all those that we are aware of today in special need of our prayer, whether it's a need of healing, a need of hope, a need of just relief after natural disasters, those sorts of things. Uh, again, and relief for those who are grieving today, especially in Havana, and for that matter, in Ukraine as well. Let's pray. Gentle Shepherd, as we gather for worship, we ask that you'd enable your church to respond to the voice of Jesus and that you'd follow the example of, of Tabitha and other disciples, giving us unfailing trust and generous hearts to join in that sacred work of renewing all of your creation. Risen Lord, hear the cries of your people. And Jesus, we ask that you would feed your people here at your welcome table, that you would provide a safe place for those whose environments might be dangerous at the moment or unhealthy, especially those who are making difficult journeys. Prosper your creation and for the sake of every living thing. Risen Lord, hear the cries of your people. And Father, warm the hearts of all who celebrate and all who mourn on this Mother's Day. Accompany those who, who yearn to be mothers and help us to heal from broken family relationships, to honor those who have nurtured us in motherly ways, no matter who they may be, and open us to recognizing others as full brothers and sisters. Risen Lord, hear the cries of your people. God of peace, come alongside those we know to be persecuted or oppressed or threatened today by the forces of war. We pray for those who don't wish to fight but have little choice. We pray for those who are awaiting word from loved ones in active war zones. And pray again for the people of Ukraine and Yemen and Honduras, El Salvador amid renewed reports of fighting there. We just ask that you would embolden us again and anew to be voices for a just peace. Risen Lord, hear the cries of your people. Lord God, we ask you'd seek out to those who weep while they are awaiting healing or consolation, whether they're tears of sorrow, tears of joy. We pray especially John, for John and Larry and Judy, for Dale and Pam, for Bob and Judy, and ask that you set people in their paths who can help provide the care that they might need today, and again, wipe their tears as they embrace and seek your wholeness again. Risen Lord, hear the cries of your people. And then for all the many petitions, God, that each of us might dare to raise before you now, if only in a whisper or the quiet of our hearts. So, risen Lord, hear the cries of your people. And so once again, Lord, we offer these petitions and those we carry in your hearts, trusting again in your abundant and your ever-present compassion. In Jesus' name, amen. Once again, the risen Christ stood among those first disciples and offered them the gift of his peace, something that they desperately needed. And so may the peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Let's take a moment to share both a sign and a word of Christ's peace with those around us today. I invite you to remain standing as you're able as we uh, are reminded of how God first loved us and provides the strength for you and I to love as well. For God of infinite grace, we acknowledge before you 
the times when we have stood tentative and timid before the claims of faith. At the same time, we ask forgiveness for when, in certitude or covering up our own misgivings, we have stifled others' questions. We sometimes behave as if having had fast answers is more important than sustaining a faithful search for wisdom and truth. Whatever it is we know and don't know, whatever we believe and what we doubt, grant that it leads us to a deeper faith, a greater boldness, and further intimacy with you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Scripture reminds us over and over that God has given us Christ so that through trust in his name, we might have life and we might have it abundantly. Your sins are thus forgiven. So go now in peace. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. And let us once again give thanks to the Lord our God. Right. right to give God thanks and praise. Indeed, Lord, it's each day that we're given that we, we do so not just out of duty, but out of delight, remembering what you have already done for us. And again, perhaps need to be also remembering the things that you still seek to do in and through us to serve the neighbors around us. For the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. And after giving thanks, he gave it for all to eat. He's saying, take and eat each of you. This is my body, which is now given up for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, Jesus also took the cup, and when he had given thanks once more, he gave it too for all to drink. He said, take and drink, each of you. This cup is the new promise of blood, my blood, shed for you and shed for all people for the forgiveness of sin. So do this too for the remembrance of me. So it is we pray once more as Jesus once taught us, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We invite you to be seated and to come forward to the usher's invitation to receive the bread and the wine. If you did receive your portable communion kit, or if you're worshiping online with us today as you share the elements, use those words, the body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you.
Let's stand together and receive the blessing. Now may these gifts of our Lord's body and our Lord's blood, given generously, boldly, eagerly, to sustain and empower you today, may they be a blessing for you. So go now then to love and to forgive as God sent Christ. So that now Christ is sending you. Respect God above any other authority and bear witness to Christ's resurrection life. In the process, may God continue the work of salvation in you. May Christ meet you in your doubts and your fears. And may the Holy Spirit fill you with the gift of Christ's peace. Amen. Let's remain standing as we sing our sending hymn, Glorious Day.
being part of our worship this morning. I invite you to stick around for some fellowship treats and conversation. Also, our adult forum on listening with love happening again in room one this morning. Hope you can join us there too. Meanwhile, go in peace to love and live and share the risen Christ. Thanks be to God.